ray tracing, a rendering technique that became very popular among gamers a few years back. So much so that some shady company even marketed their graphics card in a way that ray tracing was a major selling point. Now because of that, there are still some misconceptions among gamers that other graphics card outright don't support ray tracing, which obviously is wrong, but I will not dive into that today. I will explain how ray tracing works in games and computer graphics. I'm Digvijay C. Gohil and you're watching the first episode of this brand new ray tracing series. Let's get started. Now before we further talk about ray tracing, let's see why lots of modern game engines still uses a traditional rendering technique called rasterization. Well, that's because rasterizer is a lot faster than a ray tracer and it's the fact that game needs to have a high frame rate so it feels smooth. So rasterization is a good choice because it is a lot faster than ray tracing and I will explain why in a later part of this video, but first let's see how rasterization works. Let's say we have a scene where we have a green cube, one more red cube here and we have a camera here. From the camera's perspective, our final scene will look like this. We know that geometry is composed of vertices, CPU will throw these vertices to the GPU, GPU will determine how many pixels our cubes occupies on the screen by generating fragments. As you can see, we have an overlap here. There are multiple fragments on the same pixels. To eliminate the overdraw, GPU will discard the fragments which have higher depth values. Then finally it will color the pixels based on our base color. Alright, so far so good. Then to shade them properly, it will perform some light calculations that can be done using normals. Normals are direction only vectors or unit vectors that shoot straight out perpendicular to our mesh's surface. Then we will also have a light direction which is another direction only vector that points from our mesh's surface to the light source. Then the diffuse light will be calculated using dot product of these two vectors and we will have nicely lit or shaded geometry. Now where there is light there will always going to be shadows and here things start to get a little bit complicated. You see, in our previous light calculations, we were not considering the fact that there might be other geometry between our mesh surface and a light source. And because of that, we will not have any shadows. To tackle that, shadow mapping is used, which is a technique that requires its own separate video, but just at a glance. Imagine that this is your scene and we have a light source over there. So this entire scene will be rendered from that point to determine which objects of the scene will receive that current light. That information will be stored in a map called shadow map, hence the name shadow mapping. Now let's say we want reflections in our scene and for that we have to use another technique called reflection mapping or reflection probes. And I'm getting lots of video ideas today. Anyway, the overall point is every time we try to add a little bit complexity in our scene that exists in the real world. We have to come up with the techniques or functions that could believably mimic the real life. And all those techniques are not easy to implement, to say the least. In real life, light will emit from the light source, it will hit the surface, bounce from that and hit our eyes and we will be able to see the surface. For the object that is in the shadows, light will simply not reach it. Now of course we will still see the object because of the ambient light or indirect light that just bounces from other objects. I'm getting tons of ideas today. Now let's say we have a mirror. Light from the light source will hit it and it will be reflected. Hit this point, will bounce back and hit your eyes. And you will be able to see the reflection of the object in the mirror. Now if you are a physics student, don't take all this on the face value, this is oversimplification. Now ray tracing technique basically tries to mimic everything that I've just showed. I'm not sure mimic is the right word here. Reverse engineer? Well, it's better if I just show you. Alright, so in ray tracing, we will shoot the ray from the camera, it will hit the surface and we will determine what has been hit. How? Well, more on that in the upcoming episode, but for now, let's just say we know that we have hit a green surface. Then from that point, we will shoot another ray to the light source. If the ray could reach the light source, we know that our pixel is not in the shadows, so we will lit it accordingly. Of course, if our scene has multiple lights, we will shoot different rays from the surface for each light source. 
put the object in the shadows, ray would hit the surface. From that point, we will shoot another ray towards the light source. This time, the ray won't reach the light source due to the other geometry. So we will go, okay, this surface is in the shadow. So let accordingly. For reflective surface, the ray from the camera will hit the mirror surface. We will go, okay, this is a mirror. So we will reflect the ray and it would hit another surface. We will go, okay, we have hit red surface. Again, from that point, we will shoot another ray to the light source to determine whether it's in the shadow or not. Basically, we will shoot bunch of rays and keep track of where are they going. We are tracing them, hence the name ray tracing. And in this approach, we are essentially copying how light behaves in real life. Therefore, it is a lot easier to achieve graphics fidelity, which will be closer to photorealism. Hence, your ray trace scene will look a lot better. But the world is not all sunshine and rainbows, especially in computer graphics. No matter whatever you use, there will always going to be drawbacks. I've told you earlier that rasterizer is a lot faster than ray tracer. Let me show you why that is the case. Let's say we are rendering 512 by 512 pixel scene. In rasterization, we will evaluate 512 into 512 pixels. Here we will of course evaluate color, lighting, transparency, etc. In ray tracing, however, we will shoot 512 into 512 rays in the scene. Then to calculate lights, we will shoot another 512 into 512 into number of light sources equal amount of rays. For reflective objects, we will further reflect rays and for the light, shoot another rays. So n into n rays more. Overall, ray tracing has a lot of overhead than good old rasterization. As a game developer, it is your job whether to go for performance or graphics fidelity. If you're making a competitive first person shooter, go for rasterization. If you're making a story rich RPG, let's say, where you can afford to shave off some frames or a lot of frames, go for ray tracing. And also I have to point out that graphics fidelity also depends on individual skills. For example, I could go with ray tracing for more fidelity. But there are talented people out there who can pull this off without even touching ray tracing. That too in perhaps the most competitive esports title on this planet. And that is the overview of ray tracing. Now I see you are getting ready for example on how to use it, but you have to wait a little bit longer because I want to cover this in Unity, Unreal and Godot. I haven't figured out how to go forward just yet. Let me know your suggestions down below. Also ray tracing, a rendering technique also has a sister called sphere tracing or ray marching. You can check that out here and I'll see you in the next one.